malware analysis or something like this. There you go. That's it's fairly, fairly straightforward. Um, this one, I actually provided the information to tag each segment of memory as you dump it to where it is. So, you know, this is the address, you know, where it's allocated. You can get lots of information here, how big it is, that kind of thing. So, this is useful for when you want to find something. So, for instance, Val's password is burrito, which is in here. So, in this version of PuTTY, it doesn't sanitize the BSS section um, after taking in the password. So, you can pull this straight out. So, we now know where this is in memory, and so we want to, you know, pull it out. So it exists at, you know, this base with this, this size. So if we look at the, now this is the pull, you know, dump putty and pull the passwords out. So in here, we're basically finding all of the PIDs of putty processes. It's very dumbly. And so, in, in fact, if you, if you noticed, when I pulled up two, I have two putty sessions running. One is 5.3b and the other one is 6.0. And one is vulnerable, one is not. And so you'll see the differences in the way that they dump. But here's the basic idea you want to read at this base, this size of memory. And then we go to the, you go to the offsets in there and you can actually carve that information out of there. So, there you go. Straight out of memory. Now this of course is an example of process carving that is very useful, but the big idea is to just show how simplistic this really is using the Meterpreter API and using the script and everything. So you can do all kinds of advanced in-memory manipulation of files using just a Meterpreter script. So, the next, I guess, you know, exciting tidbit we're going to do. So the next, the next sort of logical step from carving memory is then manipulating a process to change its execution. Uh, the demonstration I used is Putty Hijack, um, which basically just patches the in-memory instance of Putty to then pipe out all keystrokes. Uh, and I somewhat cheated here because I didn't really want to write the code to do this. Interpreter gives the ability to migrate in the memory space of a process. This, of course, will make it much easier to patch it. Uh, when porting the C++ code for Putty Hijack, it was you know, four in the morning, and I didn't, uh, didn't really want to push any further. So it made it just simple to, first step in this case is I have to migrate to the process so I can then patch its memory because then I have access to all of its pages. And, you know, in, in the way that the Putty Hijack was written, uh, it uses static offsets which are only relevant per instance of Putty. So if you wanted to make this generic, you'd have to go through a little more effort and actually do a detection of what version it is. But you could, all, you could do that in memory without much trouble. But, so, you can actually we can see, you know, an added thread in PuTTY, which is the Meterpreter instance that is migrated into it. And so we'll go ahead and attach. So I had the debug view here just as a simplistic to show, to show it working. I had issues actually translating the keystrokes as they were getting the way that Putty Hijack was grabbing them. It was originally designed to shove it over a socket interface, which I didn't really want to do. So I just, for simplistic here, it's just to show you it on the debug view. So we're patched. If we look at the threads, we have another thread in there. And so you can get, you can see the, the actual thing typing. So we've basically just hooked the putty's um, key, key logging or keyboard sending event.
to then basically replay it to our, our pipe as well. So we can stop and then we can get the, get the keystrokes, which doesn't work very well right now, but maybe somebody will like this idea and take it and finish it for me. That'd be fabulous. So we're unpatched and everything's still running. Everything's there. So, so those are kind of the exciting things that you can do with Meterpreter and memory. So we just went through all this. Are there any questions so far on, on carving? Anything that's not clear? Wait till the end. You, you could, if you were profiling threads of a process and you knew how many threads are common and normal, yes. You could find the situation when Meterpreter gets migrated into a process and you could actually see all of that. So, so kind of the, like, the next logical step from here, um, which we don't really have, is network session hashes, which are stored in LSAS. Um, we, there is a PM dump option that's, that Metasploit has for pulling local hashes. It doesn't actually grab in-memory hashes for a network. So if you're on an actual network, a domain, um, the hashes you really want live in memory. They don't live on disk anywhere. And so these techniques can be generally expanded outwards to go and grab those pieces of information because those are fairly useful and you use them for pass the hash and any sort of enumeration on a domain instance. And then the next thing that I think would be kind of neat um, is introducing vulnerabilities into processes. Because all I have to do, I can make you re-vulnerable to MSO867. Because I can read your memory. Um, Skywing's paper here talks about how to patch for this vulnerability without restarting the actual process or the machine. And how you do that is you load the old DLL into memory and then you patch all the calls to that DLL. And because of the con concatenation, canonicizing call, there's actually very few function pointers you have to patch to do this. So this is not, this is fairly straightforward. You just have to upload an old vulnerable version of the DLL that you want to inject. And you inject it into the process and then you patch the process to call the vulnerable DLL. Now you have another strange way of persistence. Even though they're patched, they're suddenly unpatched. So that's, that's it for Meterpreter right now. Um, the next thing we've been working on is similar, you know, the, the title of this talk was neurosurgery. Some of that is just in memory with Meterpreter and inside the kind of the kernel that is Meterpreter. Um, eavesdrop is more of kind of a network's memory. Uh, the, the, way, the way of viewing it is that passively on a network you can see a lot of things and in, infer a lot of attributes of it. Or, you know, watching the ash cloud of your cyber Pompeii in action. So when you're, when you're on a network and you want to discover further targets to go for, there's, there's a couple of standard ways you can go it. I mean, if, if you're attacking a Unix box, you can look at SSH known hosts, you can look at a netstat and see who's connected in or where it's going out. And these are all standard. A more simplistic way is run Wireshark or another TCP dump equivalent. And you can actually gain a lot of information about a network. Networks are fairly noisy and they do a lot of things to keep track of who's there, who knows about who. ARP is a fabulous, fabulous way of doing this. So there, there are many ways, and as Dave is very kind about and likes this analogy very well, so I'll leave it here. But yeah, there are lots of tools to do this, right? You can scan a network very easily. He equates this to, well, yeah, if you bring the stripper to the black hat party and you tell her, hey, get his password, she, she might actually get it. But it's going to be pretty obvious when, you know, the, the guy the next morning wakes up and goes, no, really? Oh, yeah. So. They're very, this type of active reconnaissance is very noisy and very noticeable. So passively, and you know, the analogy here is the waiter that walks past you to give you more drinks and casually overhears your tidbits. And if you have more than one waiter, even better. You hear more of the conversation without bringing too much attention to the fact that you want to know what they're talking about. So I think the easiest way to sort of explain how ARP can tell us things is basically showing it, which here's a very large graph of just in an, of, of a general network. So if we can zoom in here, we can actually, I don't know if you can read it, 10, 246, 32, 1, 
So you can see that this, this has lots of connections to it. This is obviously a network of a server of some sort or a machine of interest, enough interest that you might want to poke at it and see because it drives